what do they call that, a segue, or they call that a transition, some type of transition. I'll think of the technical term of that pretty soon here. We are glad you're here this morning. If you have your Bibles and want to follow along, we're in Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. We're going into a new chapter in our study of Luke. And uh, I titled this one, Still Fishing, with a question mark at the end of that. Still Fishing. I love to fish. I don't get to fish as much as I used to. Um, so this passage of scripture is really, uh, I, I, I have a kin to it this morning. So, um, but first off, I want us to look at what we did last week in a very short, abbreviated way, a day in the life of Jesus. The last passage, that's the way it laid out, is we were able to walk right through what Jesus did one thing after another. And so the first thing was, he went to the chapel or he went to the synagogue. Yeah, that gets you singing that song, doesn't it? Going to the chapel. Yeah, he wasn't going to get married, but he went to the synagogue to teach. And while he was teaching there, there was a man filled with an evil spirit. And he spoke out, and, and Simon and Andrew and James and John and the rest of them were able to watch him drive this demon, had authority over the supernatural, and drive him out. Well, after going to the chapel they had to decide where they were going to eat and uh, Simon is the one who invited Jesus to come to his home along with Andrew James and John to have the noon meal the problem is is when they got there his mom or his mother-in-law his mother-in-law was needed in the kitchen but she was deathly ill and Simon asked Jesus is there anything you can do for her he had seen her great power he had seen his great power and heard his great authority in teaching but is there anything that you can do for my mother-in-law who has this high fever meaning a great infection within her body and of course he stood over her and he drove the infection away drove the f- uh, fever away in such a way that she got right up from there no recovery room uh, anything like that she went right straight to the kitchen to help prepare this meal And then what happened was evening came rolling around and because it was evening of the Sabbath, once the sun went down, then the laws of the Sabbath came off, meaning people could travel farther and people could carry things. And so what happened was Simon got a knock at his door and he opens up the door and there's a line of people, (laughs) those that are sick and afflicted, those were demon possessed. And Simon and James and John and Andrew were first eyewitnesses of watching Jesus heal every single one that came up to him. And so they saw the power of Jesus over the natural world that was there. And that went on through the night. And at some point it must have slowed down a little bit for Jesus uh, was giving the, he gave them the early morning slip. He slipped away. In the early morning hours and he found a deserted place and in other passages of scripture we know that he went to those places to pray and and the crowd found him and they said uh, we want you to stay or we want you to take you with us where where we are and then Jesus did this he stated and stating and acting on the necessary Jesus was stating and acting on the necessary he said no no I need to leave here I need to go to these other towns I need to tell them the gospel. That's what is necessary. The healing wasn't necessary. The driving out demons wasn't necessary. What was necessary was that the gospel was proclaimed, that he was the Messiah, that he had come to save their souls from sin. That's what was necessary. And so that was like a day in the life of Jesus, and you got... Uh, a picture of it, just bang, 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 what was going on throughout the day. Now we're going to switch, and we're going to go into the future, because he just got done saying, i got to go to these other towns, and i got to tell them about the gospel. And so as we go into this passage of Scripture, 
we know that this is a little bit later. And it says, as the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by the lake, Gennesaret. So um, the first thing to notice here is that what is Jesus doing? What's Jesus doing here? He's teaching God's word. He's doing exactly what he said in the last verse of the last chapter. He said, i got to go to these other towns because it's necessary for them to hear the word of God. So he is doing exactly. It doesn't say he's healing people here. It doesn't say he's driving out demons here. He's saying he's teaching the word of God here. Another thing to notice is that he's by the lake of Gennesaret. Now, the lake Gennesaret has many other names. It's the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, and in the Old Testament, it's called Chenareth. Chenareth. And uh, it's it's one of those situations where... um, we do this in town here. We have what we call Fun Fest now. But what was it called previous to that? Og- Oglesby Celebration Days. You know, and so if somebody says that term, you still know what they're talking about, even though it's named something else now. Well, that's kind of like this lake. It had many different names that it was known for, but it was, it, but it, but it was the same place that he's talking about. Um, That lake is 13 miles long and 7 miles wide. It was great to know that fact because when we lived in Gaylord, Michigan, there was a lake right there called Otsego Lake. And guess what? It was 13 miles long and 7 miles wide. Now, I've never been on the Sea of Galilee, but I've been on Otsego Lake plenty of times fishing (laughs) in a boat. (laughs) So I could uh, identify a little bit with that. Another thing to notice here is those words, to hear God's word. That's why they came. That's why they were pressing against him, to hear God's word. Literally, it means word that comes from God. Word that comes from God. Maybe to say it another way, God is speaking. God is speaking. That's why they gathered together, because they they knew that as Jesus was speaking... God was speaking. Now, just to stop there and ask, is that why we come to church? Is that why we come to church? Do we come to hear God speak? That we look at the Bible that we have and realize these are God's words to us. That when they're spoken, when they're read, it's not just the reader who is reading them. It's, it's more than that. These are God's words that have been recorded over time for us to be able to understand what he has said and what he wants us to know. I think sometimes we need to check ourselves and say, is this why I'm coming to church? Or is it, or is it just to see the other people? Or is it just to sing some songs? Or, you know, and all those things are really good. And don't get me wrong. All those things are really good. But we need to be coming to hear God's word. And that's the way they looked at it, that God was actually speaking to them. So, verse 2 says, Now he saw two boats at the edge of the lake, and the fishermen had left them, and they were washing their nets. A couple things to notice here, that Jesus is very observant. He's very observant. He, He notices the lake behind him. He can maybe feel that maybe his feet are getting a little wet, you know, from the waves that are coming in, or he can smell the sea that's there. He's observant. He's observant to look to the left or the right and see these two fishing boats that were there and that they were abandoned, but they were abandoned because the fishermen were out of the boat and they were cleaning their nets and taking care of things. And, uh, you some things to notice because he brings up about these fishing boats is on the Sea of Galilee you fish at night. You don't fish during the day. You fish at night. At night the fish come from the deep up to the surface and they come into the shallows and so that makes it easier to catch the fish. So any good fisherman would be fishing at night on the Sea of Galilee. The next thing is you clean nets in the morning. You need to clean the nets in the morning. How they would fish is with nets. There are a couple different types of nets that they had. One of them was like a one-man net. It was a round circular net. We had weights on the end. And you would take it and almost throw it like a frisbee out there. Get it out there as far as you could. The weights would hit. It would 
bring it down and have a rope on it and you'd pull it in and you'd pull whatever it caught into that. That was one kind of net. Second time of net was called like a seine net. It was a long, really long net that had weights on the one end of it. And in one boat, you would have it folded very neatly on top of one another. And then you would hand the end of that net to the smaller boat. And the people in the smaller boat would take that and they would make a big circle all the way around. And while they're going, this net is unfolding as it goes, as it goes, as it goes, as it goes. And they would make a big circle and come all the way back around to the boat. So they've, they've made now a big circle of the net. And then the men would grab a hold of that net and just pull it, pull it in. And everything that was in that circle, you would bring into the boat. So after a night of that, you, of course, brought into the net more than just fish. There's a lot of junk you brought into the net. You, you had seaweed. You had all this kind of stuff. And the nets would get caught up on stuff. And they would get jagged. And, and there would be places where you'd have to repair the nets and everything. So this was an important part of the fishing process. And, and you're getting ready for the next night. You're getting ready for the next night. You would, uh, this was the last thing that you did. You fished all night. You pulled the boats ashore, you got out the nets, and now that you can see a little better, you, you, you lay out the nets, you take out all the junk that's there, you repair any things that are wrong, you fold them up neatly, and you put them back in the boat, because what are you going to do? You, when, when you get there this evening, to be able to go right out. Now, I, I identify with this tremendously. We would go on vacation, and we would always go fishing. And before we would go on vacation, it would be like a week ahead, maybe, maybe a couple weeks ahead, how, it depended on how excited I was. But I would bring all my fishing gear into the house, all the poles and everything, and my tackle box, and I'd put it all on the kitchen table, and I'd take everything out of the tackle box, and I'd put it all over the place, and I'd clean everything up and all that, and I'd make crawler harnesses and everything. I mean, nobody could sit at the table because all my fishing gear was there. And, and, I would get, and then I would neatly put everything back in and put everything and box it up and everything and all that why did I do that because my goal was is that I wanted to pull the trailer there drop the jacks get it set more importantly put the boat in the water and once the boat hit the water I mean I wanted it so I could just jump right in start up and boom go and I had the pole ready in my hand all ready to go I mean that was the goal that was the goal to be totally prepared well these men, every morning, would get totally prepared for the night, the next night. At this point, they just want to get home and eat and sleep. You know, that's probably what they're thinking about. Oh, I wonder what she made. I, I thought this morning, I was thinking through this, yeah, maybe some ham and eggs. But then ham wouldn't be the right thing to say. Wait a yeah, it has to be something other than that. But, you know, where's what she's got made? And then to be able to fill your belly with some food, and then fall asleep to prepare for the next night. So a little bit about the fishermen. Verse 3. He got into one of the boats, meaning Jesus, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. Here's some things to notice here. Who is there with Jesus? Well, the answer is Simon. See, sometimes we think that uh, this is about the third time that Jesus has met up with Simon. Um, and we think that he followed him directly the very first time. Well, no, he didn't. We see here that when Jesus said, I have to go to these other towns and preach the gospel and everything, that Simon didn't go with him. No, Simon stayed home. And where do we find him? He's out fishing, doing what he's, what he's always doing. But here he is. Here's Jesus with Simon. And... Uh, the second thing, I've talked about this before, Jesus knows acoustics. He knows that if he gets out on this boat and the water is a conductor of sound, and actually when you're on the boat and, and speaking, your, your voice will bounce off the water and it will go farther than if, if the water was not there. And so if Jesus could get out a little bit from shore, enough to allow his voice to bounce and magnify off the water, more people would be able to hear him, more people would be able to see him, and so, uh, and I don't know, have you ever had that experience before where you're standing on shore and you can, there's two guys fishing out there in the boat and you can hear exactly what they're saying. 
I mean, just absolutely purely what they're saying, you know, kind of thing. That's what was happening here. Jesus knows acoustics. And uh, Jesus goes from standing to sitting. Notice that. He was standing near the shore of Lake Gennesaret. Now he's in the boat and he's what? He's sitting. What do we know about when a teacher, when a rabbi sets? He's going to teach. He's going to give a, a position of authority. And just a reminder, we, we do this wrong. You know, some Sunday I'm going to do this. I'm going to sit and you are all going to stand during this. <laughs> now, this is my part here. I just assume... That, that, that Simon is multitasking at this point. He's probably thinking, um, this, is, this is also his first obedience to Jesus. Because Jesus says, uh, put out a little from shore. So Jesus has asked him to do something. So this is his first step of obedience to, to actually do this. They would have had, he would have, the boats were big enough at some times there were all 12 disciples were in the boat. So it's a good sized boat. Uh, they would have had a crew. They would have to push it offshore. They would have, once they got offshore, then they would have had to ha- kind of hold it in position or anchor it down, something along those lines. So there's a lot to do there. But I imagine once he got that done, I, I imagine Simon multitasking. He's like, uh, okay, I can do this. I can clean these nets and get them straightened out and repair them and everything. And I'm, I'm listening to him at the same time. You know, while this is going on, I'll do this and, and I'm listening. He's multitasking. But this is his first obedience in this passage. And then it says, when he had finished speaking, when Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, here's a second um, request of Jesus of Simon. Jesus changes his focus from the crowd to the guy who owns the boat. I want you to see this. He's preaching to this big crowd. Must have been tremendous. They're all listening in. They're hearing about the word of God. I mean, what better for that to happen? And he gets done. He says, amen. He says, have a great day. See you next week. I don't know what he said. But anyways, he, when he finished speaking, he turned his focus from the large crowd that was there. And he looked at the, he looked at the owner of the boat. He put all of his attention on Simon at that point. Now, I I was like, what is Simon thinking about this request? All right, Simon, I want you to put out into the deep and I want you to put your nets down for a catch. Well, first off, you would say, it's the wrong time of the day. Jesus, it's just the wrong time of the day. You don't go out fishing in the middle of the day. That's not when you do this. You know, you do this at night. So that's probably running through his head. Another thing, uh, this will get our nets messed up again. We just got them straightened out. We just got them repaired. We just got them ready for the next day. If you're asking me to put them out again, then I'm going to have to what? Do this again. Oh, and then maybe Simon would have had to pay overtime. We know he had a crew. So now he's got to relay this message to the rest of the guy. Okay, uh, guys, yeah, I know we were going to go home. Uh, Not yet. We're going to go out again. What? We're going out again? Who's, oh, Peter's lost it, you know. And then Jesus is pretty confident here. Jesus says to him, put down your nets for a catch. We're going to catch catch something. Wow. Now, fishermen are pretty confident at times. We think we know. You know, we think we know the lake. We think we know how to do it. We think, man, I got that proved wrong on my honeymoon. I I took my wife on my honeymoon. That's a joke, yeah. I took my wife on my honeymoon, and I took her to, uh, we went fishing. And I took her to the lake that I know. Oh, I know this lake. I know every aspect of this lake, you know. And so I, I took her around and everything, and I know how to fish. I know how to fish. I know exactly how to fish and everything. I hardly caught any fish on our honeymoon. You know who caught all the fish? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad she did because we'd have been hungry because we didn't take any food. I, 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 I know the lake so well. We don't have to take any food on our honeymoon because we're going to be eating fish every day. Well, I'm glad I didn't go on my honeymoon alone. Uh, I'd have been in trouble. Oh. So, again, this is um, Jesus asking Peter now to obey him a second time. Uh, We go to verse 5. Peter responds. He says, Master, Simon replied, we've worked hard all night long and caught nothing. 
So now, now you get a little more of the story here. <laughs> he didn't do too well last night. I mean, there's nothing he caught. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. If you say so. Simon, we notice here, wasn't following Jesus full time. He, he didn't, at the end of um, the scene at his house where he healed his mother-in-law, and he healed all those people that came. He didn't leave with Jesus to go to these other towns. He, he, he didn't. He stayed home and he kept on fishing. So he wasn't following Jesus full time. And he calls him master in this passage. He calls him master. Now what that word master means is overseer. Overseer of what? Of a certain area. So he was basically saying to Jesus, Jesus, you're, you're, you're a master teacher. I'll, I'll agree with that. You're a master teacher. You're a master healer. Yeah, I watched a bunch of that happen. You're a master uh, drive out demon kind of thing. You're a master. You're a master in your area. And then I was thinking, this is probably what's going through his head. But because you healed, because you healed my mother-in-law, and you drove out demons in my sight. And you healed all kinds of diseases. And you teach like none other. Because of all those things, I will humor your request. Uh, okay. And, and it made me think, what if, what if it wasn't Jesus who was asking? You know, what if it was somebody else who was asking Peter to put down his nets after he had just got them cleaned up? You kind of wonder what his response would have been. You know, are you crazy? I'm not going to do that. But because it was Jesus, master, he puts it down. So he reluctantly obeys. He reluctantly obeys. Verse 6, when they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. Now, Simon obeyed Jesus even while doubting. There's a lesson to learn there. Now, lots of times we don't have all the answers. We don't understand all the answers. But when Jesus asks us to follow him, we need to obey. And sometimes we will obey reluctantly, but we need to obey what he says. Even if we don't understand it completely, we need to still obey and follow after him. Um, what hits uh, Peter here, I'm assuming, is that Jesus knew where the fish were. Whoa. How did he know that? Not only that, but during that time of the day, the fish would have been deep. They would have had to rise up to be able to be caught in their nets. So Jesus, Jesus must have called the fish to that spot. And I mean, a lot of fish, a lot of fish to that spot. Uh, the next thing, Simon isn't equipped for Jesus' ability. He's, what's happening to his nets? They're tearing. Now, we assume that Simon is a master fisherman. He's got a crew. He's got everything. So he, is, he, he, he makes sure to take care of his stuff, okay? Okay? Uh, us that like our uh, guys, I'm going to talk to the guys right now. Uh, let's, take, let's pick on Kenny. Kenny, master plumber, okay? So Kenny has to get a, a, a tool has worn out, and he has to get a new one. Is Kenny going to buy just... The, the lowest brand tool to replace that? How many of us know Kenny? No, he's not. He's not going to do that. No, he's not even going to buy the standard grade tool. No, he's not going to do that. No, he's going to look at it and he's going he's to say the greatest quality tool is this one. And it's usually a little bit more than what you need. Because you want to be prepared for anything coming along. And so if you've got a good, hefty tool, one that's a little more than what you would usually need, you're still prepared, right? You're ready for it. And, and I can imagine Simon like that. Simon's got his nets and everything. He didn't have Walmart nets, okay? No. He had Capernaum uh, Cabela nets. I mean, he had, he had nets that were a little more in sturdiness than what he needed. He probably gauged it off of the greatest catch he has ever caught before and thought, my net needs to be a little bit more than that because, you know what, I might catch more next time kind of thing. And so I imagine his nets were, were top of the line. And what's happening to his nets? The tearing. 
They're tearing. When Jesus, Simon isn't equipped for Jesus' ability. And one more, Jesus gives Simon a personal nudge. A personal nudge here. You think, wow, did he need that? Well, apparently. He went to his house. He heard his teaching. He saw his mother-in-law healed instantly. He saw other people instantly healed that came to his house all night long. Demons driven out. And where is he? He's out fishing. So apparently Simon needed a personal nudge in a certain area of his life to get his attention. Makes you kind of wonder, how come Jesus was down by the lake again at Gennesaret and, and by the boat that was owned by Simon and asked to get in Simon's boat, but he wanted to get Simon's attention? So what happens next? Verse 7, so they signal to their partners, meaning, meaning Peter, in the other boat to come and help them. And they began to fill both boats so full that it began to sink. Um, who are Simon's partners? Um, we know from before that's James and, and John. We'll see that a little bit farther in this passage of Scripture. Um, we don't just have a net problem now. What do we got? We got a boat problem. We don't have a boat big enough. The, boat, the fish are filling up the hull, they're filling up the boat so much so that the, they're sinking farther down into the water and the water is starting to come over the edge. No, I just have a net problem. We got a boat problem here. And Simon goes from, okay, for you, I'll put him down. For you, it's because it's you, I'll put him down. To probably a range of emotions and thoughts about what is happening. You get this sense, you, or maybe, that, that, that Simon, I mean, he started pulling in the net. And, and it's just full, and there's just fish everywhere. And I'm sure he went into, you know, you know major master fishermen. And, well, put those fish over here. These fish over here. Call these guys in over here. We need their boats over here. And, and put down the sail. Don't, don't move on that side. Don't move on this side. You know, probably trying to manage everything that was going on before, because he didn't want these boats to go down. Again, what we have is never big enough for what God can do. Our own ability is never big enough for what God wants to do. Uh, verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me because I'm a simple man, Lord. Luke, just to notice here, he calls him Simon Peter. Notice that? He gives him, he says both names. Now, now, now he hasn't really been officially called Peter yet, or, or is not officially a disciple yet of Jesus. But Luke, who writes this later, lets us know by giving us both names that there's a huge transition that's happening here. This is a moment in Simon's life where he is making a decision to be not just Simon, but to transition to being Peter, the one that God would use in a mighty way. Um, Simon goes from calling Jesus master, an overseer in a certain area, an expert in that area, to Lord. He doesn't call him master again, he calls him Lord. And Lord means he to whom a person belongs. He to whom a person belongs. Um, you, Lord, you, Jesus, are the kind of person people belong to. That's what he means by when he says Lord. Another phrase would be, you are supreme. You are supreme. And here is Peter thinking that he is the master fisherman in this scenario. You don't take this boat out in the middle of the day and you don't put him down. We fished all night. We know more than you do, Jesus, in this area. He comes face to face with Jesus who is, he realized, I'm not the master fisherman. <laughs> no, no, the, this guy's the master fisherman. And he goes into the submission mode of saying, I'm not the master fisherman. I'm the apprentice to this guy. I'm on my knees. I'm down on my knees. I'm down at his knees. And notice what Peter is doing. He is pushing Jesus away because of his sin. He realizes who, Luke, or who the Lord is, and he, his natural indication is to do this. When, that's, 
when you come in contact with Jesus, that's the natural in inclination. You want to push him away. And you push him away. Why? Because, because you see your sin. You see how much greater he is than you. That's the natural thing to do. Okay, verse 9 and 10a. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of fish. They were taken, and so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who are Simon's partners. Now, uh, who saw this and who heard this? Remember acoustics? It wasn't just the guys in the boat that saw all this that was going on and hearing everything that was going on, but all the whole massive crowd that was out there would have heard everything that Jesus had said and what Simon had said and all the excitement that was going on in these old two boats out there. Actually, it would have been magnified. They would have hung around for this. And the word amazed means render immovable. Render immovable, it also means totally encompasses them. So when it says, it's almost like they were frozen. <laughs> they were, when this happened, and it happened such, in such a way, they were just like, whoa. What, we can't even move. We're so encompassed. We're so engrossed in what is happening here. Now, if it would have been today, we would have whipped out our phones and taken pictures and sent it off on Facebook and Facebook Live, you know, and, and everything else. But they, they were just totally engrossed and amazed at what was happening. And it's interesting here, just to point out, many were focused on the wow factor of the moment. Many of them were. Many of them, all they could see was the fish. All they could see was the great catch. But there was somebody who wasn't focused on that. It's Simon. Because Jesus says to him, don't be afraid. You remember that phrase? Who said that? The angels said that, didn't they? Every time the angel appeared, he'd say, don't be afraid. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Jesus told Simon, from now on, you will be catching people. Now, Jesus kept his focus on Simon. Jesus kept his focus on Simon. Um, when you look at how Jesus took his focus off of the crowd and focused on the one guy, then Peter took his focus off the multitude of fish and kept it on Jesus, even though he was pushing Jesus away. Jesus kept his focus right on Peter. And while Peter was pushing Jesus away, Jesus takes another step in. Here's another law of Jesus, is that if Jesus is calling you, if Jesus is reaching out to you, your natural inclination is to push him away. But if he's coming for you, he's going to take another step in. Even though you're trying to push him away, he's going to try to get closer to you. He wants you to see that he wants you. He wants you that he would come to your lake, get in your boat, and ask these requests of you. Now, uh, Jesus sounds again pretty confident here. He says, you're going to catch men. So I was pretty confident about that. And we know that because um, Jesus dies on the cross, buried in the grave, rose on the third day, uh, meets with his disciples, gives them the great commission, tells them that they'll be filled with the Holy Spirit, ascends into heaven. They are, they are, after, uh, on the day of Pentecost, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter goes out and preaches this great gospel message. He throws out his net. And what's he get? Like 3,000 people. He catches men that day. Jesus is pretty confident about that. And then the last thing is let's replace those fish with people. Let me finish with this. Verse 11. It says, then they brought the boats to land. They left everything. And followed him. Here's the transition. They, they left everything. And followed him. Now the big question of the morning. Here it is. Are you partially or part time following Jesus? Are you partially or part time following Jesus? Has, has he made himself known to you a couple times. Just like he did to Peter. And you've seen effects of him. And you've seen some things that Jesus has done and everything. 
but, but you're still fishing. You're still going out, living your life just the same way as you were before. It's had a little bit of an impact, but, but you're still just, you're still out there fishing. You're, you haven't left everything to follow him. It's kind of like that one song, or maybe it was the scripture that you read about, there's a new creation that has happened. I think there's many times that we, uh, we know about the new creation. Maybe we've put on some new clothes, <laughs> but we're not totally changed. So I want to ask you this morning, Karen, would you come and play? I want to ask you this morning, um, are you still fishing? Have you met Jesus a couple times? Um, but you haven't left your nets. You haven't dropped everything and said, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ for the rest of my life. And I realize that what he wants to do f f through me, I don't have enough ability to pull it off. My nets are going to tear and my boat's going to sink <laughs> unless I've got Jesus, unless I've got him. So this morning, I want you to think about that. Have you left everything to follow Jesus? Or are you like Simon? And Jesus has asked you to do some things. Um, he's asked you to do some things, and you've obeyed, and sometimes you've reluctantly obeyed. But, but you haven't left everything. You haven't said, this is it, Jesus, I'm yours. And you realize this morning, he's been coming after you. And as much as you want to push him away, as much as you want to say, oh, he doesn't want me. Oh, man, if he knew, <laughs> he knows everything. If he knew what I was really like and the sin in my life. And you naturally want to push him away. Is that Jesus is taking another step toward you. And he's putting his hand out to you and saying, uh, no, I want to use you. In a bigger way than you have ever thought. You've been over here catching fish. Which is great. But I want you to catch men. With the gospel. Yeah, You ever think about that last verse there. When the, brought the boats to land. Left everything and followed him. I mean what an. It, that was a dramatic moment. For a fisherman. Who has a whole boat load of fish. Like thinking like. I'm not going to have to fish for a while. And he leaves it all there. Now there's a whole multitude of people there. What do you think they got? They got fish. Free fish. That was there. God provided fish for that whole multitude that was there. But they left everything. Dramatic moment. To leave everything and say, I'm following after Christ. No matter where he takes me. No matter where he takes me. I want to ask you this morning, are you still fishing? Or are you ready to leave everything to follow him? Would you bow your heads in prayer? So, Heavenly Father, um, as the song says, I need you, I need you, Lord, I, Lord, I need you. I just want to give opportunity this morning. If there's anyone here that feels like Peter, that I've been, I know of Jesus, I've seen him, but I'm not fully following after him. I, I've still got my boat, I've still got my nets, I've still got my crew, and I'm still doing things under my own power. But, but you, I see now that you've been coming after me, and you're not letting me go. And I want to leave everything this morning. And all I want to have in my possession is you, to be able to follow after you. I want to give you that opportunity this morning. It was a dramatic moment then. I, I pray it would be a dramatic moment now. Anybody who would make that decision to drop their nets and drop everything, I pray it would be a dramatic moment in your life. That, that, that you would, you know, November 5th, 2017 is when I dropped the boats and the nets. And I followed after Jesus with my whole life. It was a turning point. I'm not going back to fishing like I used to. Jesus got a whole other thing he wants me to do. And I'm just going to follow after him.
Would you stand with me? Continue to keep your, your eyes closed if you can. And I want to give you that opportunity this morning. If that's you this morning, and you say, that's me, and I want to make that decision today, I want you to be able to feel free to come forward and stand up here in the front, and I just want to pray with you. Uh, I, wa- I want to help you. You know, if there's any way I can help you drop your nets and say, from here on out, uh, I, I want to follow Jesus. I know him. I know him. But I haven't dropped everything. Is there anyone this morning that says, this is that's what I want to do. I want to follow completely after Jesus. If that's you, I invite you to come forward. And you and I will just have a time of prayer while the rest of the congregation sings the final song. Anyone this morning wants to drop their nets. They're inferior. They're inferior. And your boat's not big enough. The only way you can get through it is if you got Jesus, the master fisherman, who is supreme. Make that transition from him being master, really good teacher, really good prophet, to being Lord. And if you're standing there thinking, he wouldn't want me. I, I just have to tell you by scripture that that's a wrong thought. That's Satan putting that there because he wants you. Otherwise, he wouldn't be talking to you right now. He wants you. I'm just going to have her play, finish out that chorus. Anyone this morning, this is your morning to say, this is my dramatic moment with God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for accounts like this that are given to us in the Scripture and to be able to take it kind of blow by blow, passage by verse by verse, and um, see this unfolding in Peter's life, this interchange between you and him, and how everything else went into the background when this event happened. The multitude went into the background. The multitude of fish that was caught went into the background. And all that you see and all that is focused on is this conversation between Jesus, you, and Peter. And that in our own lives, it's the same way. That everything fades into the background. The multitude of the people in the church. The the multitude of maybe sins in my life, Lord. All that goes into the background as you have this conversation with me. And I finally realized that, that... that you don't want me to push you away. You want me to grab a hold of you. I pray this morning that um, this message, your word, as it says, does not go out in vain, but it will continue to work upon our lives. And if we realize that we are still just kind of fishing, and um, Lord, that we would have that dramatic moment where we drop the nets and we leave the boats on the shore, and say, I'm, I'm following you, Jesus. So your, your blessing upon this congregation, Lord, as we have heard the word of the Lord this morning. And um, we ask all this in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Larry, come and lead us in our final song.